If Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive. Have no illusions. Uh, good evening to everyone, and I'm happy to welcome you at our second lecture in our wartime lecture series. And today I'm very happy to uh, welcome Marcy Shore, who is the historian and associate professor at Yale University, and who will be giving lecture uh, today on um, uh, memory politics and topics of responsibility. Uh, my name is uh, Anna Sipchuk. I'm associate professor at Kiev Mohila Academy. I'm also director for research at School for Policy Analysis, who is together with Alumni Association of Kiev Mohila Academy and uh, uh, Kiev Mohila Academy itself uh, in partnership with Gissing University and uh, Eastern European Studies Center at Gissing University too, are organizers of these events, a series of lecture in which we reflect on uh, the war in uh, Ukraine and uh, on everything that uh, changed and is still changing after uh, Russia uh, invaded Ukraine in uh, uh, February of this year. So I'm very happy to Welcome, Marcy Shore, and uh, I'm giving this floor to you, please, Marcy. Oh, thank you, Anya. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, let me first say two things. One, I'm, I still have this post-COVID cough, and I'm going to try not to lose my voice, but if I, if I do, don't take it personally. I have lots of cough drops here. I'm going to try to talk to you for the whole time. Um, when, when Anya first invited me this summer to give this lecture, my one hope was that um, by the time the date came, it would no longer be a time of war. And I would still be very happy to talk to you. I would be you know, delighted to talk to you when there's not a war. Um, unfortunately, the, the war is still going on. Um, and as lovely as it is to talk to you, I, I wish it were under happier circumstances. Um, let me just add to before I get started that one thing I've been really deeply moved by with, uh, so many, really all of my colleagues um, in Ukraine, my fellow historians and philosophers and sociologists, um, is that, you know, when the war started, my, my impulse was that, you know, we are not going to ask them to do anything, you know, we're of course, like, we will cancel everything, they should be under no pressure, they shouldn't have to write, give lectures, feel pressure to take part in Zoom discussions, you know, they're in a life or death situation. And I, I found very quickly, that my colleagues started saying, no, we want to participate. Um, no, we don't want to cancel. Like, um, no, please just like ignore that air raid siren and let me continue talking to your graduate students. Um, and I, the, the determination to continue intellectual life in, in human circumstances um, has been extraordinarily moving to me. Um, I, as a historian too, I like, I know this tradition, you know, I know the tradition of the underground universities and I know the tradition of the flying universities. It's one of the things that first drew me to East European history um, years ago when I was much younger. Um, so I'm, I'm incredibly moved um, and I am kind of honored and flattered to be able to play a small role in that. Um, and I am just hoping we all kind of get through this time and can henceforth meet in more cheerful circumstances in person. Um, okay, I'm going to talk to you today about memory politics, guilt, and responsibility. I'm going to talk to you about history. I'm a historian. I'm going to talk quite a bit about philosophy. Um, I'm going to focus on cases that are affecting Ukraine, but that are not Ukraine itself. Um, so I'm sure many of you have questions and things you want to say about memory politics in Ukraine, and I'll perhaps leave that to you to bring them up. Um, I always feel slightly stupid talking to Ukrainians about things Ukrainian. Um, so let me, let, I'm going to, I'm going to speak mostly um, for the next, you know, half an hour or so um, about German Russia and Germany, Russia and Poland, but tease out some universal themes. <clears throat> 
Um, so, so going back to the moment that I keep going back to these days, which for those of you who have sat through my lectures before know, I keep going back to 1989, which was this moment of extraordinary hope. And um, as my, my friend Ivan Krastev wrote in this Guardian piece about Gorbachev, it wasn't just that everything was objectively so promising or Gorbachev was objectively so wonderful. It was a coming of age moment for our generation. Um, and when you're 17, when you're 18, you want to see the world opening. And so it was a kind of combination of the world opening in 1989 and through the 1990s and my being at a very impressionable age. Um, and it was a thrilling time to be an aspiring historian because the archives were just opening. And at that time, we believed in a kind of liberal teleology of progress in which they started to open, they're gonna keep getting more and more open. We didn't really foresee the moment, um, which Russian you know, and post-Soviet historians did foresee that it was going to turn the other way and archival access would tighten up again. Um, I was part of that generation that <coughs> felt like now we're all gonna bask in the light of truth and um, you know, the wicked witch is dead and we're, we, maybe we're gonna live happily ever after. And of course that, that quickly revealed itself not to be the case um, even before Putin came on the scene. And, and one of the first things I, I understood when I started learning these languages and going into the archives was that the throwing open of the door of the archives, um, while it may be kind of objectively a good thing and uh, a healthy thing, what was not going to be a very nice thing. And that the, the metaphor of the Wizard of Oz was not really the right metaphor. That the more apt metaphor was the one I now use um, that comes from psychoanal psychoanalysis. That for, for Freud, the unconscious is like this kind of dark psychic closet into which everything too disturbing for the conscious mind is thrown. And it, it builds up over the course of a lifetime. And really the archives were like that Freudian unconscious, that dark psychic closet into which everything too disturbing for consciousness was thrown. And what Freud understood was that when you start coaxing the contents of that dark psychic closet into consciousness, into the light of awareness, it might be, you know, it might be healthy, it might be a good thing, but it's not going to be nice, it's not going to be pleasant, it's going to be agonizing. Um, and that's, that's what happened through the 1990s. Um, Later, I, I, I read Nietzsche and um, his essay on the uses and disadvantages of history for life, where he, he opens with some cows. My, my kids love the anecdote about the cows. When we go to Krasnogruda on the Polish-Lithuanian border every summer, there are lots of cows. You know, and Freud and uh, Nietzsche says, you know, look at those cows. Why do you think they're so happy? You know, why do you think they're so content? It's because they're not thinking about the past. They're not thinking about history. They're totally unhistorical. They're just living in the present, you know, and that we will never know what happiness is, you know, because we have this historical consciousness. Um, and for Nietzsche, this is basically miserable um, and digesting too much history was like overeating. It would lead to nausea. It was dangerous. History was only for those with an iron stomach um, and only the strong could handle a lot of history. Um, and so drawing on kind of Nietzsche and Freud, that's kind of now colored my perception of what I had originally um, begun to experience as a happy time in the 1990s with respect to being a historian. And one thing that I also understood in time as things came out of the archives was more and more about the nature of totalitarianism, um, both Nazism and Stalinism. And I'll leave aside the question of comparison and just these experiences these kind of modern political experiments um, that Arendt describes in Origins of Totalitarianism and in Truth and Politics differed in some ways from pre-modern um, pre regimes that also had certain kinds of ideologies and that also aspired to authoritarian control in that there really was this eclipsing of, of the boundary between public and private. And there was an eclipsing of a space for anyone to stand aside. So one of the things that was significant, you know, about Nazism and even to a greater extent about Stalinism was that everybody is implicated. There's no place to stand aside. Um, 
uh, you know, Nazism lasted from in power from 1933 to 1945. That was 12 years and it was 12 very long years and the world has not yet come to terms with it. The Soviet experiment lasted for 70 years and everybody who lived in that system experienced being implicated in it. And this was a very long time. This was several generations. And the decommunization impulse that comes with that, you know, also comes with the threat of erasing people's entire lives, you know, of, of then leaving them with a history in which there was no innocent space for them to stand. Um, okay, so let me let me talk a little bit about this, this problem of guilt and innocence. I'm gonna speak in my intellectual historian role here, kind of moving between history and philosophy and kind of blending them together. Um, so, you know, in different languages, there are different words for these kinds of things. Um, you know, in, in German, you have the word for Gangenheitsbewältigung, because the Germans like taking words and smushing them together to make bigger words. Um, and so this is a very long word for Gangenheitsbewältigung, which can be translated in various ways, but I tend to translate it as a kind of grappling with the past, struggling with the past, confronting, fighting. Um, I think grappling is probably the best. Um, and that, that attempt to grapple with the past, you know, gives us memory politics which then is, is an, a politicization of that attempt to grapple with the past and often an attempt by governments to legislate, you know, a version of history or a means um, with which the past could be grappled with. I want to talk first about the Polish case, which is in a way that the case that I, I know the best um, and, and presents also a certain paradigm. And in, in Polish, they call this politica historyczna, which is literally kind of historical policy, um, although it doesn't work quite as well in, in English. Um, and, and the trope um, in the Polish case is very much, you know, an attempt to create a kind of Manichaean division between innocence and guilt. Um, and as a policy to try to create an image of, of Poland as a kind of trope of Christ-like martyrdom, you know, and above all, a kind of insurance that everything bad that happened came from the outside. And of course, there are very many bad things that happened to Poland that came from the outside, and no one is in a better position to understand that than Ukrainians or perhaps Belarusians, because they're they're more than well aware of what it means to be, you know, invaded um, by Hitler's regime from one side and Stalin's regime from the other side. Um, and this this spirit of historical policy was captured in a, a Polish law, which has gone through various versions um, over the years. Um, that essentially legislated a prison sentence, at least initially, um, for those attributing to the Polish nation, wh whatever that may be, responsibility for Nazi or communist crimes. Um, and the original version of the, of the EPN law in um, 2006, 2007 read, whoever publicly imputes to the Polish nation participation in organization of or responsibility for communist or Nazi crimes is liable for up to three years in prison. And um, the historian Dariusz Stola at that time wrote, um, wrote a letter to Gazeta Wyborcza that was published. It's published as an essay, which in fact is my, I think is one of the, the best and most on point responses and representative of a whole school of responses, just particularly well written. And he said, and this is my English translation from the Polish, um, the original project authored by the Senate Legislative Office was unambiguous. It enjoined the prosecutor to act in every case of imputing to the nation or the Polish state or a group of Polish citizens and or individual persons being Polish citizens. With this, the authors claimed that no Polish citizen has ever taken part in any Nazi or communist crime. As a history professor, I hope that such an opinion result only from thoughtlessness and not from a complete lack of knowledge about Polish history in the 20th century, or an equally harmful desire to deprive Poles of a fundamental aspect of human dignity, the capacity to choose good or evil. For if neither groups of nor individual Polish citizens had anything to do with these crimes, then why all the ado about the iniquities of the communist regime? After all, everything bad was done by some alien creatures most likely Martians. Um, there was a 2018 version of, of this law 
that initially provided a prison term for up to three years for people who publicly and against the facts attribute to the Polish nation or Polish state responsibility or co-responsibility for Nazi crimes or other crimes against peace, humanity, or war crimes. This was partially repealed in June 2018. It's, it continues to go through various versions. Um, Russia's 2014 law against the rehabilitation of Nazism is, is very similar um, and you know, enforced in a much more draconian way, um, not unsurprisingly. That law makes it a criminal offense to, quote unquote, deny facts recognized by the International Military Tribunal that judged and punished the major war criminals of the European access countries to approve of the crimes this tribunal judged and to spread intentionally false information about the Soviet Union's activities during World War II. It's this spread intentionally false information um, that, of course, is a kind of catch-all, as well as, you know, the spreading of information on military and memorial commemorative dates related to Russia's defense that is clearly disrespectful of society and to publicly desecrate symbols of Russian military glory. Okay, you don't you don't have to have caught every word of that, but you kind of you get the idea that you're kind of creating an impression of, you know, of of some kind of entity, some kind of state entity, national entity that is pure and innocent and good. And everything bad came from the outside, from alien others. Um, It's this plays very well into fascist politics, which I friend Jason Stanley um, uses as the title of his book on the topic, Us Versus Them. Fascist politics always involve this kind of hard division, this draconian division between insiders and outsiders, between us and them. You know, the polls say me and Oni. Um, But it's also to be a little bit more generous about this. It's an expression of of a human need to find a safe space in in the world. Um, And the idea that everything bad came from the outside, um, from some kind of aliens, is, is enormously comforting because it means you can kind of get together with those who are your own, with, with Nashi, and feel that you found a, a safe space. Um, the, the tragedy, of course, of the human condition is that there is no such safe space, that what we fear is always, you know, also both inside us and can never be cleanly understood as being across, a, across a, a very clear divide. There, there's a brilliant short story, which is now becoming a play, um, by the way, by Nathan Englander, the American Jewish writer, Nathan Englander, called What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank. Um, some of you may have read it. I've, I've taught it many times. Um, if it hasn't been translated into Ukrainian and or Russian, I hope somebody will listen to this short reference and decide to translate it. I think it's one of the most important moments in post-Holocaust um, Jewish literature. And I'll, at at the risk of spoiling the story, I'm going to give you the very short version because I think it's philosophically very significant. And the story is about these these two girls um, who are are Deb and and Lauren, who grow up in an Orthodox community in New York and they're best friends through high school. And then high school ends and they go off in different directions. Um, One of them marries a secular Jew, moves to Florida with him, has one child and has a kind of typical American bourgeois middle-class life. Um, And the other one marries the child of Holocaust survivors. They become ultra-Orthodox, they become Hasidic, in fact, and they move to a Hasidic community in Israel and, you know, live this life, you know, as if they were living in a Hasidic community in the Pale of Settlement 200 years ago, and they have like 10 children. Then they lose touch with each other 20 years later, find one another via Facebook. And there's a reunion in Florida when the couple from Israel is visiting. And there the husbands have never met each other before. And these two women start talking and they, they, the couples start drinking and they start smoking pot and they start reminiscing. And one of the things they reminisce about is this game that they used to play in high school um, called the Anne Frank game. And the Anne Frank game, they grew up in this Jewish community, was they have to imagine somebody they know who is not a Jew, the postman or the bus driver, you know, or the cashier at the store or somebody they have some casual relationship with who is not part of their community because he's not a Jew. You have to imagine that person and say, if that person were in occupied Europe during the Holocaust, would he have saved us? Would he have saved me? It was an imaginative game. And now all these years later, they start you know, drunk and stoned and reminiscing, they start playing this game again. And now with one another, 
and the the woman who is is secular um, has to look at at her husband who is a, a secular Jew and imagine that he was a Gentile in occupied Europe during the Holocaust and say, would he save me? And she looks at him and says, yes. And then the woman who is, you know, who's ultra Orthodox has to look at this man, you know, who she married 20 years ago, who is the child of Holocaust survivors, the father of their 10 children, um, you know, a, a deeply religious Jew. And imagine, you know, that he is, he is a non-Jew, he is in occupied Europe, would he save me? Would he risk his life to save me? And she looks at him and she says, yes. But at that moment, all four of them know that it's not true, that she's not sure. And that uncertainty becomes the source of silent terror in the room. Now, I realize I've, I've ruined this story for everybody, but it doesn't make sense unless I, I tell the whole thing. And what's extraordinary about that is this, the sense that all of this attempt to create a Jewish community that could then clearly delineate who is an insider and who is an outsider and to find a safe space among one's own. And that's all unraveled because what they fear is also inside us, that evil can never be safely you know, consigned to the point on the other side of the border. Um, okay, let me, let me move on now and um, speak for a few minutes about the... Uh, about the Russian and German cases. Now we've gone through a little bit about the Poles and the Jews. Um, so this attempt of memory politics to find a safe space in the world is a failure. It will always be a failure, I think, because there is no safe space in the world. This is really the tragedy of the human condition. There's nothing that can be done about this. Um, but there's still a greater failure of memory politics. And this war has made that particularly ostentatious and egregious, this other failure of memory politics. Um, and that I feel is a conflation of guilt and responsibility in a way that obscures and obstructs responsibility. And I'm, I'm now going, I'm going to get back to that in a few minutes and I'm going to kind of take you through why I want to make that argument. Um, and I think that's still a, a greater failure than this you know, impossibility of finding a safe space. Um, so to, in 2016, I, I had the good fortune to be invited to a series of discussions called Debates on Europe that was organized by the Fischer Stiftung and some other German foundations in collaboration with various post-Soviet partners. And there were a series of these debates in different places. Um, the only one I was able to get to was in St. Petersburg um, in 2016. <coughs> It was, in fact, the last time I was in Russia. Um, I was especially grateful for the invitation because I was, at the time, working on a book about the Maidan. And it was really important to me that I go back to Russia before I sent that book off to press. I felt like I, I, you know, I'd been to Ukraine several times while I was writing the book. But I felt like I needed to sit in the same room with my Russian colleagues and, and look them in the eye and really try to understand what's going on. And it was really, I was the only American there. I mean, these were really German-Russian discussions. Um, in some sense about Ukraine, although Ukrainians were conspicuously absent. Um, I won't go into the details, but it has largely to do with the fact that the, the, the Ukrainians who had been working with these debates on Europe, it was not going to be safe for them to cross into Russia because they were at risk of being detained. Um, so they were largely German-Russian discussions. And at a certain point, you know, the topic became, you know, Nazism, Stalinism, and who should apologize to whom. And the Germans, in a certain way, felt superior because they have accepted guilt for Nazism, you know, to a certain extent, unambiguously, you know, with few exceptions. Um, they have apologized. Um, they have repented. Um, and so now they're looking at the Russians saying, you know, when are you going to apologize and repent you know, for Stalinism. Um, and then there was a lot of yelling about <coughs> dead grandmothers and whose dead grandmother should apologize to whose dead grandmother. Um, and a lot of talk about pokoyanya, you know, and, and re repentance really with this kind of heavy religious undertone um, and under what conditions should repentance take place? And under what conditions is it meaningful? Um, and then a lot more, you know, a lot more angst um, 
and defensiveness and guilt about dead grandmothers. Um, I should I should add that there was nobody in this room, as far as I recall, who was old enough to have been personally guilty of any Nazi or Stalinist crimes. Enough time had passed. There was nobody in that room who was of, of, of probably even a teenage age and certainly not an adult age at the time of the war. So the people who were guilty, you know, were largely dead at this point. Um, let me let me let me spend a couple minutes now talking about the the German case um, because I I was I was haunted by this at the time um, because I felt like these were these were not the right questions. People were asking the wrong questions. I felt like here we are, we've got a bunch of fantastically smart, serious people in this room. We have Russians, we have Germans. We're thinking about Nazism. We're thinking about Stalinism. <coughs> and really, I thought the question should not be whose dead grandmother should apologize to whose dead grandmother, with all respect for dead grandmothers, but the question should be, it was, it was already that moment when Trump was on the horizon. It was May 2016, two years into the war in the Donbass. Um, you know, we could clearly see what was happening in Russia. You know, we could see this, you know, this totalitarian regime becoming ever more lethal in its kind of postmodern, um, post-truth form. And I thought the question we should be asking about Nazism and Stalinism was not who should be, you know, atoning for whom, but how were they possible? How were Nazism and Stalinism possible? You know, under what conditions does morality completely break down? And what can we do to stop that from happening again? Um, and I'm thinking about, the, I've been obsessed with that since those discussions. I know my colleague, Sergei Lebedev, um, was there and spoke out very bravely about that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I know he's also been obsessively thinking about that since then. I mean, you know, one thing that's come up now on the table has been a kind of revisiting of, of German memory politics and saying, okay, Ukrainians have now criticized Merkel for allowing Germans to become so dependent on Russian oil and for believing that Putin could be subdued through economic ties. And where did that whole Vondel door Kondel change through trade policy come from? Um, and it was very much bound up with memory politics. So when 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 Willy Brandt initiates this kind of this new Ostpolitik in 1969, you know, it's bound up with a recognition of, of, of German guilt. Um, in August 1970, Brandt signs the Treaty of Moscow with the Soviet Union, pledging to respect post-war borders, disavowing the use of force. Um, and that same, later that same year, he visits Warsaw. And some of you might remember this scene, or at least remember seeing pictures of that scene. But the German, West German Chancellor Willy Brandt visits Warsaw, and then he seemingly spontaneously drops to his knees before the monument honorer, honoring the heroes of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in the center of Warsaw. And this startling gesture of a kind of repentance beyond words, so unorthodox for a head of state, became iconic that this, this head of state on his knees in front of this monument in Warsaw. Um, you know, the Germans have, been, have paid billions of euros in reparation to Jewish victims. Um, German youth have been sent to do their civil service in Israeli nursing homes, in hospitals and youth centers. Um, you know, concentration camps like Dachau and Buchenwald have been turned into museums and memorial sites, educating visitors about Nazi atrocities. Um, in 2005, a huge um, 19,000 19, square meter memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe was opened right next to the Brandenburg Gate in the very center of, of a unified Berlin. Um, there have been there have been incredibly striking gestures of, of atonement. And those have kind of mixed together with, after 1989, what um, I think Adam Micknick has referred to as a utopian capitalist package um, that I think many of us on both sides of the Iron Curtain believed in or bought into in the 1990s, which is the conviction that liberalism, democracy, and kind of neoliberal free market trade belong to some kind of indivisible whole. 
and that we were now kind of this was the only like this was the only real ideological alternative now to free market you know free free market capitalism liberal democracy which were all all went together we were now all proceeding towards the end of history um, inexorably and we would all live happily ever after and so there was this sense of that like if you once you you engage people in this world of free trade and you are kind of naturally pulling them into this liberal teleology of progress um, moreover, playing into this German relationship towards Russia is the Germans' guilt for towards Russians for what the Wehrmacht did during World War II. Um, as all of you who are listening know only too well, there was no Russia per se in, on June 22, 1941, when the, the Nazi Germany launched Operation Barbarossa. It was the Soviet Union. Um, the Ukrainian and Belarusian republics were still more dangerous than, than the Russian Soviet Republic um, at that time. These were the places where the populations were passed back and forth the most between Nazism and Stalinism. This is where the Holocaust by bullets took place, where the partisans were more, most active, where population losses were proportionally the greatest. Now, all that said, um, Soviet has been connected with the idea of Russian for, for Germans, and German guilt has been performed as a kind of reluctance to pass judgment on the Kremlin's imperial ambitions. Um, I think this is part a kind of compensatory indulgence of a former victim. I think it's part a principled of subliminal impulse to reserve condemnation of savage imperialism for Germany itself. Um, and the result has also been a kind of retreat into a quasi pacifist passivity, a kind of reluctance that Germans have to act, especially to get engaged in acts of violence um, as a compensation for having once acted too much. Um, let me now turn briefly to the, the Russian case, um, which is obviously both radically different, um, but yet results in, in, in a kind of similar problem I'm going to argue in a couple minutes. Um, it's a, always very strange. I'm talking, I can't see anybody I'm talking to. I mean, normally I kind of look in the eyes of my audience and then try to kind of figure out like if I'm talking too fast or too slowly, if you know this, if you're bored, but I'm now talking to this screen. So I, I have no feedback whatsoever. Um, so hopefully you're following me and I'm trying not to feel too stupid. Okay. Um, the Russian case, the Russian case is very different um, for a variety of reasons, but I just want to highlight some of them. One was that... Um, Bolshevism was a revolution that devoured its children. There was no position in the Stalinist Soviet Union that was analogous to being an Aryan in Nazi Germany. There was no safe space in that sense. You know, if you were a pure blooded Aryan in Nazi Germany, you know, and you were not a soldier actually fighting, you were in, you know, generally in a very secure position until the very end when your country was occupied. But the Nazi Germany itself was not coming after its own people. There was that us versus them distinction was maintained in a fairly stable way. That us versus them distinction, which was also so important in Stalinism and all of the rhetoric about, about enemies and enemies of the people and you know, eternal vigilance, but that us versus them, that, that who was us and who was them was continually shifting. Um, Soviet terror was self-inflicted. Everybody was terrorized and everybody was implicated. And so to repent on behalf of one's grandmother for her complicity in Stalinism is psychologically much more complicated because it also threatens to bring with it a crushing burden of guilt for one's guilt. Because after all, your grandmother was also a victim of Stalinism and very likely of Nazism as well. And to apologize on behalf of these dead grandparents is also to betray the memory of their unbearable suffering. And this is a kind of impossible situation, you know, psychologically. Um, but let me let me quote here Sergei Lebedev, who was at these discussions with me, um, and you know he was a Russian speaking, you know, inside of Russia was clearly taking a much greater risk than I was, and the bravery, especially, struck me at the time, um, as it as it does now. I mean, he's he's no longer in Russia, um, so I. I say this and quote him now, um, not feeling that I'm putting him at particular risk. But afterwards, he wrote an, an essay about guilt and responsibility, um, in particular about the Soviet case. I'm going to quote a passage of it now. And, and Sergei writes, given the enormous complexity of this typology of, of crimes, of Stalinist crimes, and their vast scale and all-encompassing nature, virtually every citizen 
ends up being directly and at least morally complicit in acts of violence. In the same way that a gang tries to ensure its members are bound by ties of blood in order to compel them to loyalty and silence before justice. The roles of the criminal and victim are interchangeable. A dekulakized Russian peasant sees the, the Enkavude officer as the criminal. From the point of view of a deported Latvian whose country was invaded by the Red Army, the peasant too bears partial responsibility for the intervention. And for a citizen of Czechoslovakia in 1968, the children of all those listed above who served in the Soviet Union's army are representatives of the aggressor country. The Soviet system, Janus-like as both a domestic and foreign aggressor, created this double identity of victim-invader, victim-criminal, which cannot be easily subjected to moral judgment. Just a, a couple weeks ago in, in Vienna, Russian emigrate composer um, who has, has been devastated um, like, like, like many of like, like many Russian emigres and Russian liberals who feels that they have failed um, and the failure is unforgivable and irremediable. Um, and he, he reminded me that the, the history of any Soviet family makes Shakespeare's dramas seem like stories for kindergartners. Moreover, in the end, Stalin defeated Hitler. Um, it was arguably, it was the Soviet Union's greatest moment. It was arguably the only great moment. Um, I, I, I mentioned, I said this recently in an essay I wrote, and a Polish friend of mine said, Marcy, you forgot about Gagarin. Don't forget about Gagarin. That's not fair. And I'm like, oh, that's true. You're a Gagarin. Yes, I'm like, um, I'm not a big STEM tech person. Um, but there was that great moment. There was, there, there was, you know, Gagarin and the spaceship. Um, but that it was the Soviet Union's greatest moment, the defeat of Hitler, you know, creates a kind of natural temptation to reenact that moment. Um, let me just mention one other thing about the, uh, about the, the, the Russian case. Um, and here I'm going to, to quote a, a friend of mine, um, a, a sociologist who's actually from where you are. She's from Soviet Kiev, um, a Jew who grew up in Soviet Kiev of my generation um, during the Soviet period. Um, and, and later made her academic career in Germany and, and Austria. Um, she is, by the way, somebody who is underexploited on, on Zoom because she doesn't lecture in English. But if anybody is still willing to listen to a lecture in Russian or partially in Ukrainian, partially in Russian, um, she's one of my, you know, she's one of my favorite and most insightful interlocutors. She is passionately devoted to helping Ukraine at, at the moment. And somebody should get her to do some of these Zoom lectures. Anyway, this, this is Anna Shortsudoznovskaya, who I, I call my long lost cousin because we share part of the same last name, although I have no reason to think we're actually related. Um, but but several years after the Maidan, you know, she was telling me how she was in in Russia doing sociological interviews. And one of the questions she was asking, she's a sociologist, you know, was how do we prevent something like Stalinism from happening again? Um, like Stalinist terror from happening again. And and she came back to Vienna, she said, Marcy, not only, not only did people not have an answer they did not understand the question. And it was this, they didn't understand the question that I found so revealing. And she used this expression in, in German, Naturgewalt, um, which is like a, a violent act of nature. She's like, for them, for them, Stalinist terror was like Naturgewalt. I mean, it was like a violent act of nature. It was like a tsunami or an earthquake or a, a rainstorm. You can't stop the rain from coming. And the best case scenario, you have an umbrella in the closet, but you don't have agency to prevent it from happening. Um, and I, I think that's that's what that that very that seemingly you know very minor anecdote I found enormously revealing. Um, okay, let me just talk very briefly now about the American case, which I can't resist doing because it plays into this argument well, and then I'll I'll sum up some of my conclusions. And also because as an American, it's strange that I never talk about American, and um, we're not actually so much better than anybody else. In fact, we're not better than anyone else at all. Um, we we very nearly had a, a successful fascist coup here um, just under two years ago and uh, January 6, 2001, as I'm sure you guys know. And one of the things that's happened in the wake of that is um, a, a public debate over um, something that is called critical race theory. 
which sounds like a fancy phrase, um, but really is just scholarly elaborations of the insight that racism is engraved in institutional structures that are inherited, that we as Americans in the present have inherited from the past. So it's actually not particularly radical at, at, at all, but it's been villainized by the right as having a, a scary name, critical race theory. Actually, anything with theory sounds kind of scary for a lot of people. Um, and as everybody knows, like you know, we have this country was founded on slavery. Slavery lasted for a very long time. Um, you know, it only ended through a bloody civil war. Even long after that civil war, a good century after that civil war, we had Jim Crow laws. Um, the Jim Crow laws were segregation laws. They were literally the inspiration for the Nazi Nuremberg laws, literally the inspiration for the Nazi Nuremberg laws. I mean, yeah, like, there were actually Germans, you know, who were sent to study the Jim Crow laws and, and come back and construct the Nuremberg laws. Um, a, a reminder to those of you who may have either not known or repressed this or forgotten, the United States sent racially segregated military troops to fight the Nazis. Just think about that for a moment or think about that later tonight. Um, slavery in America was abolished in 1865. Most Jim Crow laws were overturned by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, Anti-miscegenation laws, um, which actually made interracial marriage and, and the uh, interracial reproduction of having children, um, continued to be legal in various states until they were declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1967. That's over two decades, you know, after, you know, after the Allies defeated the Nazis. It was actually illegal for whites and blacks to marry in many states. Um, so what, what critical race theory says is basically that, that even though these things are over, their effects linger because they are embedded in structures. Um, I won't go into much detail about this, but you know, for instance, a very long history of housing segregation, racial housing segregation in the United States has influenced property values. Public schools in America are funded not by the federal government in Washington, but by local property taxes. So where property values are low, so public schools don't have any money. Um, the, the, the racial wealth gap between the average white and the average black family remains 10 to one. Um, one in three black men in the United States will go to prison at some point in their lives. Um, black Americans receive higher drug sent sentences. There are a history of negative racial stereotypes portrays black women as welfare mothers who are lazy and living off the state and black men as super predators who are threats to everybody. Um, and one of the things critical race theory says is that white Americans objectively benefit from being exempt, for instance, from negative stereotypes applied to blacks, even if they do not subjectively hold racist views themselves. Um, it's basically just saying there is such a thing as structure, you know, that it's not only your individual feelings about things, you're, we're also embedded in structures. So many Americans have kind of villainized critical race theory out of a refusal to be labeled guilty for what they have not done themselves. You know, nobody alive in America now is guilty of slavery. You know, slavery you know, ended long before any of us who are still who are alive today were born. Um, and Americans have an ideal of individualism. Um, you know, the what, former American politician Bob Strauss liked to say that every politician wants us to believe he was born in a log cabin he built himself. Um, the memory laws that have come up, you know, in you know, in an attempt to counter critical race theory, which is just to say that we have inherited institutions that we might not like the fact that they were built on racist structures, but we've inherited them, so we have to grapple with them. Um, and the the backlash against critical race theory was captured, for instance, in a proposed New Hampshire bill of this year, um, which reads, among other things, no teacher shall advocate any doctrine or theory promoting a negative account or representation of the founding of the history of the United States of America, you know, in New Hampshire public schools, which does not include the worldwide context of now outdated and discouraged practices. Such prohibition includes, but is not limited to teaching that the United States was founded on racism. Of course, the United States was founded on racism. It's kind of incontrovertible, but the attempt is to say like, no, we were always innocent and anything bad happened because you know, it, was, it was being done by somebody else somewhere else somewhere else. Okay, um, I now want to want to kind of move to um, some 
more philosophical thoughts about this. Um, paradoxically, Americans' insistence on individualism is what inhibits responsibility. And what Americans actually share with both Germans and Russians is a conflation of guilt and responsibility, which stymies, which kind of obstructs and, and squashes the latter. Because by implying that responsibility in the present is dependent upon guilt in the past, memory politics have, have obstructed rather than encouraged the taking of responsibility. Um, and, and to use an analogy that some of you may be more familiar with, one of the things that critical race theory has in common with revisionist Marxism um, is that it's basically the question on the table is where is the border between determining historical conditions and individual agency? This was the question that, you know, that Marxist thinkers, including former Stalinists, were asking, especially between 1956 and 1968. You know, how do we inject Marxism with a more robust sense of individual agency without throwing out, you know, the point that is so crucial to Marxism, which is that, you know, his, we are how we think and how we live and what we do and can do in our possibilities, you know, are also determined by the historical conditions in which we find ourselves. And that, that I, I, I'm very interested in revisionist Marxism. I've, I've written about it. I, I work on it. I, I know many people are just no longer interested in any kind of Marxism at all, but um, which is understandable. But let me, the, the short version of that story of what East European philosophers did during those debates on revisionist Marxism through the 1960s was they reached the conclusion that, that, that determining historical conditions versus individual agency is not an either or question that the relationship between subjective choice and objective circumstances is always interactive. We are always embedded in structures that predate us, but that does not mean we are helpless and inert and don't have agency. We are shaped by structures even as we shape those structures ourselves. And, and the subsequent move that that tradition of, uh, that became a tradition of dissident philosophy um, the, these, the subsequent move these philosophers like Karl Kosick, Lesha Kolkowski, and Anna Patochka made through the 70s and 80s was to say that responsibility was not a contingent relationship to this or that, but a constituent element of each of our being. And I think this understanding of agency within embeddedness should be the model for accounting with the past replacing repentance for the sins of, of dead grandparents. Neither guilt nor innocence can be inherited. History, though, can be and is inherited. Um, I'm going to use, you know, Heidegger has this idea of Geworfenheit. Heidegger, who himself was quite guilty, um, Geworfenheit is this great German word that if you, I tell my students that once they know it, they'll be amazed they could have ever gotten by without it. Geworfenheit is literally thrownness. Our existential condition is one of thrownness. We are thrown into history. We are always already thrown into history, which just means that there's no tabula rasa. We are not like born into a world in which we get a blank slate and we start from nothing. There's no such thing as a frictionless world. You know, we're always in a certain time in a certain place, just like there's no magical Archimedean point outside of the world with which we can look on the world with perfect ob objectivity. There's no such thing as a tabula rasa. We're always already thrown into history. Um, we're thrown into history. History is inherited. That does not mean we aren't guilty of what, of what people did before we were born. But the fact that we are not guilty does not mean we are not responsible. We are responsible. We are responsible not for atoning on behalf of those who lived before us. We are responsible for seeing the past with eyes wide open. Um, my model of this um, is, is Martin Pollock's book, The Dead Man in the Bunker, Der Tote im Bunker, for those of you who read in German. Um, and, and Martin is just a wonderful person in general um, who does give a lot of these Zoom talks about Ukraine. His, his English is perfect. And he's, he's an Austrian writer and a Slavicist. Um, it's probably the most important Austrian German language translator from Polish. And, and he's the son of a, of a Nazi. Um, he's the son of an SS man. He comes from a whole Nazi family. And he wrote a book about his father called The Dead Man in the Bunker, which is not about like neurotic guilt for feeling you know, guilty by contiguity. It's about 
his responsibility for seeing the past with eyes wide open for facing the truth. Um, and this idea that we are always already responsible for facing the truth. Um, the, one, the one truly decadent thing I, I did during the, the lockdown was I listened to Volodymyr Rafaenko's Zoom course on Ontologia Literatory, um, which he was teaching at that time in, in Russian. Um, from the Dacha village where he was living outside of Kiev after he fled from Donetsk at the beginning of the war. And, and one of the phrases that Volodya likes to use when he teaches, which really became deeply kind of embedded in my consciousness, was Zdiesisichas. Zdiesisichas nada bichlovyakom. Zdiesisichas nada imyet no sovyest. This is, you know, responsibility is always Zdiesisichas. It's always here and now. And the source of this responsibility is not personal guilt. The source of responsibility is what Heidegger calls being in the world. And the argument I want to make here is that responsibility transcends the div division between guilt and innocence. There's no escape from it. You know, guilt relates to facts. You know, and, and Hannah Arendt, in one of my favorite essays by her Truth in Politics, says that facts have no conclusive reason for being for whatever, for being what they are, they always could have been otherwise. And this annoying contingency is literally unlimited. I mean, she uses the example that Germany invaded Belgium in 1914, but there's no law of physics that required that to happen. Facts are always contingent. They might have been otherwise. Guilt relates to facts, choices, actions, which always might or might not have occurred. They might have been otherwise. They're facts a posteriori. You know, guilt is a posteriori. You know, guilt is ex post. Somebody does something and they are guilty for it. So guilt is contingent. It's, it's uslovno. Um, responsibility is not. You know, responsibility is always already. Responsibility is, is a priori. It's non-contingent. It's part of what it means to be a human being. It is always here and now. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote to you um, from Jan Patochka's letter to my, my late friend Krzysztof Michalski, who founded the Institute of Human Sciences in, in, in uh, Vienna. And this is a, a letter he wrote in the 1970s, I think 1973. And he said, Heideggerian philosophy ontologizes responsibility and thus negates the modern separation of ethics from ontology, which has given rise to so many disasters and for which the false moralism of the moderns to a large extent bears the blame and which has contributed to Nietzsche's abolition of morality. Responsibility is not a relationship to just any being, but rather an ontological movement of, of Dasein. So for those of you non-philosophers out there, what this basically means is that, you know, is that responsibility is a kind of ontological characteristic. It's a priori. It's always already there of what it means to be a human being, what it means to be the kind of beings we are. It is not dependent or derivative of on or anything else. It's always, always with us. It's always diasisichas. Um, and when, when I, I, my, the model I've been using now when I talk to American audiences, um, I sometimes reference that that clip um, that your president, that President Zelensky made in that selfie video that he takes right after the invasion where he and a few of his colleagues in the presidential administration come out onto the streets of Kiev, you know, and he says, Ia president tut. Um, and that, like in philosophical terms, that was the existentialist mo moment. You know, I, I am here now, I am taking responsibility here and now. Um, and that tradition of East European philosophy, which I feel very close to, and which I now want to read against a tendency of, of memory politics, which makes responsibility contingent upon guilt and substitutes atonement for taking of responsibility in the present, is that responsibility has to be non-contingent, always here and now, always part of what it is to be a human being. Okay, I'll um, stop talking now and, and hope that made some sense to those of you who are listening. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, there's been a lot of insights for me, actually, as, uh, um, as I think um, uh, very, um, yeah, a very important um, notion that we all we, we often talk about memory politics and uh, uh, 
and uh, guilt and responsibility, but we actually very often, I think, forget, forget to um, to kind of um, uncover what it means and what is behind these words. And I, I, fi I find actually personally very revealing what, what you, what, what, if, if I understood you correctly, in a way, uh, kind of memory politics is kind of between uh, us, uh, us uh, trying to uh, see see the history with eyes eyes wide open. Yeah. In a way, uh, so it's probably uh, if I'm right here and understand that for in some part memory politics is kind of something that kind of obstruct this taking of uh, responsibility here now. Uh, should I yeah. answer or should I let you talk? <laughs> yeah. Should, should I respond or, or yeah, do you want yeah, to keep yeah. going? Or, no, but no, no, you're right. I mean, this is, I'm, I, I'm looking at, one of the reasons I've looked at these different cases is that I think even the, the German case, which I think was, you know, an attempt to face the past in good faith has mm -hmm. nonetheless obstructed the taking of responsibility. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there's, and I think part of the, I, I'm thinking about that now because when I see Germany hesitating about sending weapons to Ukraine, you know, in part because they feel like we need to have learned from our guilt. I feel like this isn't, this dependence on, on German oil, the indulgence of Putin, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the failure to like to move quickly with the way I feel like this isn't it's a lapse of responsibility. And I feel like the lapse of responsibility doesn't necessarily just come from decadence, but from a certain understanding, a certain conflation of guilt and responsibility that we have fulfilled our responsibility by accepting guilt, you know, and by accepting guilt that leads us to do things like we don't want to get involved with violence. Um, mm -hmm. which may be the wrong, I mean, I think that guilt and responsibility are two different things. Yeah, 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 I got that. And I, I actually uh, I'll have a bit of, um, I don't know if it's a question, but what uh, um, at, 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 on one hand, uh, I, I very much agree with what you're talking, especially this concept in one of the comments, uh, uh, it is uh, we have one of the comments that actually uh, is saying that thrownness into history is haven't heard that before great concept and uh, this is the so, so the and the, this concept here and now is uh, I think it's very up to up to, uh, thing to say mm -hmm. uh, and I like it very much on the same at the same time. Um, when kind of applying this what, to what is happening now with this division of responsibility and guilt and here and now, uh, I, I, I very much um, struggle with the, with, the, with the question of uh, how, how we deal with, uh, with uh, not necessary, or, I, I don't know what word even to use here, guilt or responsibility, but how we deal with uh, people not doing something, not committing something, but let's say not doing something or looking the other way. Because um, when, I, when I look at Ukrainian debate about, for example, Russian or and Russia, uh, Russian opposition, for example, um, in general, Russian people. Uh, we recently had a, a, a results of the poll where around 70% of Ukrainians think that Russians are responsible for, um, for what's going on in Ukraine. And uh, of course, it's not that people think that uh, Russians are all uh, guilty of, you know, taking our mar arms and going into Ukraine. But it's also not about looking at responsibility in a sense of looking into history. It's more like being responsible for non-action or kind of losing this this um, agency, or if we can say. And I actually think uh, what with this quote that or this um, um, instance of interviews uh, that your colleagues done about this violence being an act of nature and this. Uh, with this example with um, uh, people not not even understanding the, the problem with Stalin mm. and uh, his regime is, is is very revealing in this 
in this matter because it's kind of if 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 violence is the act of nation then you can't uh, uh, sorry nature then you probably can't do anything because you can't stop the thunderstorm uh so 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 here i'm struggling with how, what word you use for that or what should you use for that for you know looking the other way not being political not getting involved yeah, uh, no no that's uh, this is a, this is a huge question well first of all i would um you should you should definitely ask Anya to come give a talk because she's as I said be, because she doesn't lecture in English she's underexploited, um, and she's she's one of my favorite interlocutors who has been following this very closely. She writes in both Russian and German, largely in German. Um, that but that that and what she said also plays into something that I know Slavko Herzog Yaroslav Herzog has mm -hmm. talked about a lot since since the war began. Um, probably before that as well, where when he's trying to explain to foreigners that he says, you know, the key difference between Russia and Ukraine, between Ukrainians and Russians, is not about language or ethnicity or how you make your borscht or like folk songs or like, it, I mean, it's it's about political culture. And what he really means, it's about this sense of agency. You know, are you a subject or are you an object? You know, are, I mean, are you an actor or are you a kind of recipient of, of fate? Um, I mean, for me, this was one of the miracles of the Maidan was that it was this moment of coming into subjectivity. Um, in, in Polish, they, they nicely distinguish the word podmiotowość from subjektywność, um, which is, is very helpful. So like, in, it's because it, that the word subjectivity has a kind of double meaning in English. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in Polish, you can actually pod mi otowosz, what it means to be a subject as opposed to an object, what it means to have agency, you know, what it means to be in the first person and the nominative. And when the Maidan happened, you know, one of my, my Polish historian friends said, you know, well, Marcy, pod mi otowosz, like the last time I heard that word was during the time of solidarity. And that was a key concept that people like Adam Miknik injected into the discourse in 70s and 80s. Like, what does it mean to be an actor? You know, and this idea that, that Adam, have of, Adam Miknik had of living as if. You know, living as if for him was you live as if you were a free person taking responsibility for all your actions, regardless of any kind of sociopolitical constraints. You know, to live as if it's to take responsibility despite constraints, you know, in that conception. Um, and I think that, I mean, trying to, I mean, I'll, I'm one of many people who's been tearing their hair out, trying to understand what went wrong in, in Russia. And Volodymyr Rafael used the expression, the uh, anthropologiczkaya katastrofa, this kind of anthropological catastrophe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Eugenia Monasterski saying, everyone's saying, nie interesujes politico. Like, well, I mean, it, which is what, what you're saying. Like, what does it mean to say I'm not interested in politics? I mean, I'm in principle not interested in politics either. I don't really like being interested in politics. But it's one thing to say, like, I'm not interested in, you know, tax reform law. And it's another thing to say, like, there's mass slaughter being carried out, you know, mm -hmm. and people are like bombing kindergartens. And I'm not, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm not interested in politics. At a certain point, you cross a line. You know, from like when, what is political and what is what, you know, where have you crossed the line into the moral, into the ethical, into a space where there's no there's no morally legitimate way not to take a position. We have far crossed that line. I think it's there's no legitimate space, you know, in Russia or anywhere else to say I'm not interested in politics. Therefore, you know, I'm not going to take a position on mass atrocity. That's not politics. You know, you've. I mean, Hegel has this idea that there are moments when quantitative changes become qualitative, when changes in scale mm -hmm. become changes in kind. What's happening with the war is on a scale far too dramatic to be confined by the concept of politics. Um, but yes, this, I mean, I, I, I mean, I get this too from, I went to Vilnius to, and I talked to people from the Russian opposition um, the summer, I mean, all of whom basically devastated and like on the verge of suicide and like feel like, they have failed, you know, and that failure is is unforgivable and irremediable, you know, and it, it's all lost, you know, and they'll never forgive themselves and they'll never forgive their people. And they'll never, I mean, it's just, it was, of, of all the people I met with the summer, Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russians, psychologically, the Russian opposition was by far like the worst state. I mean, it was a kind of unbearable guilt and sense of failure. But what everybody kept saying you know, is that there's no sense of, of agency on behalf of most people in our country. That people, are, it's not that, this is not a country full of people who just like 
you know, with a kind of bloodlust, take great pleasure in the idea that we're killing Ukrainians. But there's there's a sense of people just kind of staying out of things, uh, as you said, like not taking a position, hiding, um, deciding that, you know, whatever doesn't have anything to do with me. And in any case, you know, the value of a human life is not worth that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm looking if we have any questions. Um, uh, then uh, uh, probably not. Uh, we have a couple of comments uh, just on the, on the lecture, but uh, no no questions. Uh, but I, I have probably then uh, another one. Uh, would would you would you uh, to continue probably? Would you say because there is a, a there is an argument that it's a, a moral catastrophe, mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, you know this kind of um I, I actually wonder if if the question is about uh, like political culture and this um, absence of agency can we really talk about moral catastrophe or not uh, um yeah i mean i think okay i'm gonna speak now as an Arendtian, which I very yeah. much am. Um, Hannah Arendt was one of my first loves and greatest mm -hmm. loves, and she remains someone I keep thinking with. Um, and I, I take her position that she articulates in the book on Eichmann in Jerusalem, where so there's this moment where, it's obviously a very controversial book, where she, for, so for my listeners who, who don't know, so Adolf Eichmann, who was the organizer of the so-called final solution um, during the Holocaust, who was the, the German civil servant who organized the transports to, to the death camps. Um, and he was, he escaped after the war and was living under a different name in Argentina. The Israeli Mossad looked for him for many years, um, finally found him in 1960, 1961, kind of illegally kidnapped him in Argentina, brought him back to Jerusalem to stand trial. And it became a kind of show trial that was not just of this one man, but of, of the Holocaust and a kind of pedagogical, a pedagogical trial for the next generation of Israelis to learn what had happened in Europe during the war. So it was a huge moment. Um, you can read the transcripts. You can watch the testimonies. Mm -hmm. It's like extremely well documented. But Hannah Arendt, who was a German Jew who had left and escaped in 1933, um, and was then had long had a, had long had a career as a political philosopher in the United States. Was then sent by the New Yorker to Jerusalem to cover the trial, and it's significant in this case that she's listening to Eichmann defend himself at this trial, and he's speaking in German and it's her native language. And the, the intimacy. I've been thinking a lot about these cases too, but because you know Ukrainians know Russian. You know, and that that kind of intimacy with which with listening, it's different listening in your own language or listening in a native language. Um, and she's listening to Eichmann speak German. And she says at a certain point, it became clear that his inability to speak was connected with his inability to think, you know, and namely to think from the point of view of another person. Mm -hmm. And people took this argument and they, they hated her for it because they said she's just excusing him. She's not excusing him. I mean, for Arendt, the greatest crime is a failure to think. There is never any excuse for failing to think. The fact that he just like, he didn't, you know, what, what, what is shocking to her when she gets there is the discrepancy between the mediocrity of the person and the monstrosity of the crime. He doesn't particularly hate Jews. He has no strong feelings about them. He was a bureaucrat. He was interested in advancement. Um, he tried to do a good job at the task to which he was assigned. He didn't give it a whole lot of thought. <coughs> I mean, that to Arendt doesn't make him better. That, if anything, makes him worse. You know, there's no excuse for a failure to think. Um, and so I, I don't think that this, like, we're just not paying attention. We don't care. We haven't given it much thought. I don't think that that's, that should not be understood as an attempt to excuse people. I mean, I think that, I, I think we need to, to understand when that's when when the core of evil is in that particular failure to think, um, and I, I definitely have the sense that something like that is happening in Russia, and I definitely felt like I mean it's something like that happens in the United States too. I mean this is one. Mm -hmm. I mean I realize I'm biased because like I'm a professor. I teach. All of us who teach feel like it's our job to teach people to think. 
There's no shortcut. There's no substitute for people who can think. There's no way to get around that problem. You need people who can think. Yeah, and uh, I, I I can very much relate to what you are saying because I I also think that, you know, um, uh, uh, quite uh, um, we we had a recent translation or second edition of the, of this book uh, uh, I Eichmann at uh, Jerusalem, uh, but uh, um, uh, previous edition was was under the name the banality of evil, mm -hmm. and in many cases I think that. Uh, this concept of banal evil, banality of evil, mm -hmm. in, in many ways are much worse than, you know, thinking about this existential, mm -hmm. is someone being existential evil, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, devil reincarnate yeah. or something. Um, so, so yeah, I, I very much uh, uh, feel, feel what you are saying. Um, we, uh, we have a comment, uh, I, I will just read it. Um, uh, 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 it's from Anna Grinkevich. Adorno writes in negative dialectics that exactly Hegelian dialectics of quantity and quality was the source of thinking that made Holocaust possible, mm -hmm. that devalated millions of lives in a moment. Um, not sure uh, if it's uh, if it's intended as a question or yeah. as a commentary. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I, Adorno is one of the people who is been most you know who is kind of most famously part of that debate that links totalitarian terror to the enlightenment in a kind of yeah. in a kind of hegelian dialectic way um and that question of were were the sources of that kind of terror you know were they paradoxically present you know in enlightenment mm -hmm. thought you know and adorno makes this kind of dialectical yeah. argument um yeah. which yeah i think is very provocative <laughs> I mean, probably yeah. we don't have time to get into it here, but like, yeah. but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, I, I teach that. I mean, I teach that as well. And I mean, of course, if we had decisive answers to these questions, we could all just like save the world and go home. I mean, the reason why we keep, you know, rereading Arendt and rereading Adorno and tearing our hair out. Um, and, it, you know, it's because we haven't come up with answers. I mean, my, my 10 year old daughter, like my, my kids know much more about this this war than probably any kid should have to know, although, you know, they're still very privileged by not actually having to be in it, unlike the children of a lot of our friends. And mm -hmm. my, my daughter was, you know, they're constantly asking questions, you know, and the thing they want, they, they can't, that they can't understand is why would Russians want to do this? Like, why do they want to come kill Ukrainians? Like, why, why do people just decide they want to, like, you know, bomb a children's hospital? Like, why? Like, why do you do that? Like, why, why not, like, you know, you know, get up and go jogging instead. Like, why not? Like, what, 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 where does that come from? And the one thing I, you know, I was at one point, I, I said to my daughter, I said, you know, like historians, you know, sociologists, I call it like, we've all like, all of us who have studied this stuff, you know, who have like really tried to understand how these things happen. We've, we've come to understand a lot about how racism works, how fascism works, how totalitarianism works. We really understand a lot very well, but what we haven't, you know, what we haven't succeeded in doing is coming up with some kind of magic recipe to make it stop. And my, my, my daughter, who is very much a child of the pandemic, um, like, like her, whole, her whole cohort, you know, said, mommy, you know, we need a vaccination against manipulation. <laughs> Um, which kind of rhymes, you know, in, in English, you know, and I, she's like, why don't we have a vaccination against manipulation? I'm like, yes, that's an, it's an excellent point. That's what we don't have. Um, you know, one thing I've, I've heard, you know, of Lodia, your, your Malenko say in podcast is that, you know, there's technical, t technical pro progress has not brought moral progress. You know, mm -hmm. the whole idea of a liberal teleology of progress, it works much better if you're talking about cancer treatments. Like my, my father is a retired physician, you know, and he will tell you that like, you know, that people who were diagnosed with diseases he never possibly could have saved when he began to practice became very easily treatable, you know, decades later, that there's a very clear arc of progress, you know, and but Volota's point remains like, why is that like, why doesn't that hasn't that obtained in the rest of life? You know, how is it that we're in the 21st century and we're watching mass slaughter carried out like in front of our eyes and we haven't come out, we haven't come up with any way to make it stop. Um, I, I mean, I like, like, why is there I mean, my daughter's like, you know, OK, so like, you know, coronavirus came out and then like, you know, we waited what seemed felt like a really long time. But then they came up with a vaccine. Like, like why, you know, why don't we have a vaccine for fascism? And we yeah. don't. 
Yeah, uh, and in a way, uh, if if we buy into Adorno's argument, it's actually that the same technical progress that happens enables. Right, right, uh, right, right. right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the thing, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, it also got me uh, thinking that uh, in many, especially when you were talking about clear, clear line uh, between innocence and guilt, and uh, being the ability to draw clear line. Um, in some way, it seems very uh, like for me in, in the war that is happening now um, here. In, in one way, it's a very clear line between Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, <laughs> like. But on the other, uh, I know that uh, uh, we've been doing a couple of interviews, like a number of interviews. It's not a couple, uh, quite a lot actually. And I also know from a lot of personal stories from people I know. That actually there is a lines in between families. If for those who have relatives in, in Russia, um, there there is a line between where we with our relatives are on the other side, or where mm. people in interviews tell me that they stop talking to their mothers, fathers, uh, brothers, and mm. sisters. And uh, in, on one hand, we draw the clear line between countries and. Yeah. Uh, our identities in a way but on the other hand uh it's what kind of line is that because it's it's certainly not a bloodline yeah so it, it, so in a way it's also makes you know <laughs> makes us think yeah. about this um, be, the ability to draw draw clear cut uh clear cut divisions those family stories have been some of the most wrenching you know, that the, the, the stories of the parents not believing the children. And because they're all, I mean, it's, they're all these families, as you know, like on both sides of the border. Now that's, I mean, early in the war, uh, a, a Russian colleague of mine who is I think her, married to Ukrainian, long been, long been living in the States, um, you know, asked if, you know, she like asked if we could meet. And, and I said, oh, sure, come by my office. She's like, no, no, I want to meet like somewhere private. And like, so we met, um, and she just starts crying and she's like, my parents won't believe me. They don't understand what's going on. She's like, I call, they're my parents. You know, she's like, I call them and I'm like, I plead with them and they, they, they won't believe me. They say, no, no, we're just coming to help people. Like, we're no, 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 we would never like, yeah. Like, no, no, like, and, and she, she's like, I can't, I mean, can't, like, I can't tell, you know, she, I mean, and she's like, you know, she's grown up, she's middle aged, she's a mother, she's like, but how, like, but she's like, how could this be? How could they possibly, how could I have lost my parents, you know, to this, you know, Pierre V. Canal? Like, how could they? Um, but this, of course, I mean, you know, her story struck me because, like, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here at this coffee shop with her in person and she's crying, but like, that's, you know, there are thousands of these stories, you know, that are going on, you know, in, in real life. Um, the, the other thing I would I would add about that is, you know, one, I've talked to a lot of Jewish audiences here, too, since the mm -hmm. war began, you know, and as you know, in addition to like Polish Ukrainian issues, there are Ukrainian Jewish issues. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people say like, well, what about, you know, well, what about the UPA and what about Bandera and what about the pogroms and what about and the thing that I have like been trying to kind of to shift everyone's thinking of is that there. There's, there's basically, with maybe a very small handful of exceptions of, you know, people who are, you know, over 100 years old, there's no one alive today, you know, who is actually guilty, you know, of that kind of violence, you know, towards Jews, you know, during and, and before the war. And now I feel like Ukrainians need to be judged, you know, not, not on, you know, their taking responsibility for things that were done before they were born, but on their ability to look at their own past with eyes wide open. And this is one reason, like, I, I love Martin's mm -hmm. book so much, and he's been such a model for me. I mean, he's one of my closest friends in Austria, you know, and I'm an American Jew, and he's a child of an SS officer, and that's never been an issue, like, and it's never, and not because he spent his whole life repenting. I mean, he doesn't feel guilty of what his, his father does, but he feels responsible to face that past with eyes wide open. I mean, he feels responsible to look clearly. This is a kind of phenomenological perspective, right? Like, you're, you're respons responsive, the subject's responsibility is for truth. You take responsibility for truth, you know, and I feel like, I mean, that's what a young generation of Ukrainian historians I've like I've met has been doing. You know, it's not about, you know, it's not about atoning 
you know, for what you did not do yourself and could not have influenced. It's about having the courage to see it clearly. You know, that's what we need to do in America. Like that, that's what you need to do in Ukraine. It's what everybody needs to do. No. Like there's no, like you have to like, you have to think for yourself. You have to face the truth. Like there's no shortcut around these things. Um, I think we have to disentangle guilt and responsibility. Um, and I, I think it, I mean, I think it can be done. I think it's mm -hmm. possible. I want to, I, I have kids. I have to believe it's possible. <laughs> but uh, uh, just, uh, just a short, but it, it also presumes that there is an ontological truth. Uh, uh, okay. So, right. So, it, well, it, it presumes there's a factual truth. Uh -huh. okay. it, right. it does. It does. It does. Yeah, right. No, this is part of the larger question about post-truth, right? So the, 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 the The argument that Arendt was making that I quoted in, in Truth and Politics, mm -hmm. she said, well, the thing about factual truth, as opposed to like philosophical truth or like two plus two equals four, but factual truth is, is contingent. Like it's only something is true because it happened. There's no law of physics that, that made it have to happen. It was true because it happened. And you know, she said, factual truth always bears the vulnerability of its original contingency, because you could also always imagine a world in which it happened otherwise. But it's that kind of factual truth that's been under assault in these times of post-truth. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have alternative facts. Well, now we have maybe this, maybe that. You know, and I do think there has to be, factual truth is contingent. It's a posteriori. It's not a, a, a priori. But I think we, it, it still is our grounding Like, I think we still have to believe that it exists. Um, <laughs> I think in that sense, like, as, you know, as, as sympathetic as I am to, you know, lots of post-structuralist and post-modernist theory, I think that position that the East European dissidents take about living in truth in the 70s and 80s is like, I think you have to, you have to believe that, like, that there are things that happened, you know, and you have to kind of, you have to face them and you have to believe that it's not a free for all, that it is real. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think it's very important points, uh, that, uh, the, and it's probably a very fit, a fitting end to <laughs> uh, to to the uh, to our discussion or our talk. And uh, thank you very much for this lecture. I I, I very much enjoyed it, and I I hope uh, that uh, everyone who's been watching also enjoyed it, and the uh, recording will be available, and. Uh, I thank you very much, and uh, I will invite everyone next week uh, for another lecture with uh, uh, Paul Danieri. Uh, Marcy, thank you a lot, and uh, oh, my pleasure. Evening. Thank you for the invitation. Take care, everybody. I hope to see you. Peace, la Peremohi, in uh, in Kiev. <laughs> yeah, thank you, and bye. Bye, bye. Bye. If Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive. Have no illusions.